Again, my, uh, I commend you for your staying power and your high level of energy and interest. Um, it has been quite a day, but we are not done yet. And um, as you know, through the course of the day, we've looked at this problem or the challenge of sustainable energy and water future and what can be done about it. So from the beginning, understanding the problem from a global perspective, different context, to seeing what different players can do to make a change. So the piece that we're gonna focus on last um, that I really hope uh, leaves you with um, a spirit of empowerment and a challenge to action um, and really stretches your mind to think about what else can be possible. So it is my great pleasure to say that we have Ted Howes joining us. Um, he's been working with the World Economic Forum on the issue of sustainable consumption. So um, there's some things that you can do from the government top down that companies can do in the energy industry from the supply side. Companies can do um, with their operations and their supply chain, but at the end of the day, people have power. And Matt Kopeck said so it may be an ice pick, but use those ice picks very strategically, we can accomplish great things. So not just swords into plowshares, but ice picks into levers, and Ted Howes to challenge us and um, inspire us. Thanks, Ted. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Carol, for the, that uh, lovely introduction. And it's my, my pleasure to be back. I was here a few years ago uh, at an energy symposium back when I was leading uh, energy and clean tech at the design innovation firm IDEO. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I love hanging out with, with students and hearing what's on their minds and what they're thinking about. And, and what I'd like to do now is is talk about some of the things that I've been working on for a, a, a while and thinking about. And really the challenge, I think the opportunity for us all is to think as I go through some of the ideas, how can we start to apply these things in, in what we do? How can we better design uh, uh, products, experiences, services for people in ways that connect with them uh, and, and really attend to their unmet needs? Um, I think that's fundamentally what design thinking is about and I'll talk a little about that. But this notion of sustainable consumption is an interesting one, and I'm not going to waste our time uh, providing a definition of sustainable consumption, but suffice to say that it, it, when we talk about sustainability and have talked about sustainability as a, as a term, it's gotten so uh, elastic as to be almost meaningless to people. And so when we were thinking about, well, what if we get to true sustainability, what does that look like? We kind of have to give it a different lens. It's not just about doing less bad, it's about doing more good. It's about ensuring that those resources exist, not just for future generations, but allow them to thrive. And that's really what I mean by sustainable consumption. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the rules, uh, tools, and norms that I'm seeing that support sustainable consumption. Uh, but first, uh, I'd like to tell a bit of a story. Um, I've been thinking about the energy space for not as long as some of the other speakers. Um, it's been, uh, a real pleasure to hear them talk about their, their depth of experience. But I spent about four years uh, working in energy, working with utilities, working with clean tech firms, trying to help them uh, with, with some of their issues, uh, particularly around innovation and, and getting closer to consumers. But this is uh, where, where I kind of think my experience in energy begins. This was a, a Life magazine uh, double, paid ad, double page advertisement from uh, 1962. And you can see one thing, that we've made a lot of progress. Um, I, I don't think a brand today could get away with a message saying, each day we supply enough energy to melt seven million tons of glacier. So we've made progress. But we also acknowledge, you know, we're, we're encountering some, some, some challenging times. We're, energy, we're, we're entering into a more constrained world. And it doesn't matter what those constraints are, whether we're talking about access to water, uh, access to natural resources, access to arable land. All of these are big, big challenges, but we've made progress. But the way we have to get past this, um, this, this current phase is we have to get towards um, getting away from the incremental and getting to the revolutionary. So here's my, here's my story. I've been thinking about this for a long time. We've all seen the magazine covers. The Sports Illustrated one is my favorite. Um, 
And actually, in, in, uh, I, I think that uh, major league teams have done a lot around getting us to sustainability in terms of their activities, um, except for the air travel, but we won't talk about that. So, I was doing a lot of work around smart metering, and I was like, ah, oh, this is gonna be super cool. Now we have this uh, mesh network grid and all this always on information, and I no longer have this lag time between when I hear about my energy usage and when I have to pay for it, and this is gonna be fantastic. And so in my neighborhood, when they were you know, doing the smart meters, I was really excited to meet my smart meter guy. And I didn't meet my smart meter guy, I, I, I missed him. Um, but fortunately for me, this is what he left behind. And so here I had all this pent up excitement, uh, about a year and a half of pent up excitement thinking about the new digital, digital experience around energy usage. And what I received was this piece of paper uh, attached to my door. And what I love about this piece of paper is it doesn't say anything about my benefits from smart metering. It says, you know, in the last sentence I've highlighted here, in the future we will be able to provide you improved information you can use to better manage your energy bills. That's fantastic. Okay, I get that. But above that, with the smart meter program, we will be able to read your energy usage remotely without setting foot on your property and without interrupting your schedule. Great. How does that really help me? Um, the other bit of information in this uh, pamphlet was we'll be able to turn off your power remotely. Again, <laughs> not such a big benefit for me, right? So, I mean, this was the touchstone. And this was just when in California, where I'm from, they started to have these issues around smart metering. And people started to react really strongly. Um, and were saying, I don't want to have the smart meter. I don't want the government understanding how much energy I'm using. And it was a broad range of actors who weren't just saying you know, anti-government, but about privacy, um, about economics, because in Bakersfield, they saw their energy prices go up and up and up. And this is constituencies that before this were never organized or aligned or interested in energy issues. But with this issue of smart meters, it just galvanized them. And with the way the rollout was, with those very small pieces of information that weren't really about my interests and my needs being fed to me through pamphlets, people started to organize. Eventually, it resulted in a class action lawsuit against PG&E out of Bakersfield. For those who are energy geeks, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and it, you know, all of a sudden people who were, uh, this is in the North, North Bay counties of uh, near San Francisco, where they were concerned about the Wi-Fi frequencies affecting their, their health. Um, and these are all very real issues. And the way the utility approached it was fundamentally, we run the network, you buy from us, you're a rate payer, not a customer, here's what you're gonna get. What I challenge us to think about is think about it differently. How would we redesign this if we were going to design it to meet the needs of people, to meet their interests. What would it look like then? And we all know that you can't just open up a can of sustainable innovation, right? You really need to uh, get under the hood. And we need to get away from this monologue where uh, entities like the utilities are telling you what to do. And we need to help them redesign this into a conversation, go from a monologue to a dialogue. The challenge is, broadly speaking, sustainability to date is, uh, is mostly uh, defined by the content, not the context. We talk about these three overlapping circles of sustainability. The opportunity to be sustainable is the blue part. <laughs> what I challenge us to look at a little differently is let's put people back in the center. Um, I think these issues of, of social and environment are actually far more overlapping than we give them credit for. If we put people at the center and focus on how does the economics support this enterprise of our species, of our environment, of our society, how might we do that and what does that look like? So it's important to have tools to do this, and I think one of the tools that, that I find very valuable in my career is uh, around designing innovative programs is design thinking. And really the fundamental precept of design thinking is starting with people, uh, figuring out what's desirable for them, figuring out what's feasible from a technology standpoint, uh, viable from a business standpoint, but really what's desirable for people. And in order to do that, you really have to start a little differently. If you have, and I was talking with somebody just earlier about this, and there's the old Einstein quote that if you have everybody who's thinking the same way, you aren't really thinking. And I think fundamentally that's true. So you really need to bring in people from different disciplines. And so one of the reasons I was excited to talk today is because we have students here and professors here from different departments, different schools coming in to create cross-pollination. 
um, to create cross-disciplinary understandings of issues. I think that's really important. Um, when we're building multidisciplinary teams, we like to bring in designers, ethnographers, prototypers, people who think very differently about the challenges. This creates a lot of dynamic creative tension. It results in, in uh, better impact because you create um, products that you would otherwise not create if you had everybody who was uh, similar in mindset. And let's really understand what matters to, to people. Um, this is the, the, the fundamental truth, is that if you go in, and this was a, uh, maybe about a year and a half ago, I was doing an energy project where we were looking for new innovative services that a utility could provide to its uh, customers. And I actually did call them customers and had a chief customer care officer. It was pretty cool. Um, and, you know, if we went and, and, and called her on the phone and asked her, you know, tell us about your energy usage, she'd know what to say, right? You'd get some information bias. She'd talk about what she does does to reduce energy, should talk about how she conserves, what her bills are, all these things. But instead, if you go into somebody's home and you say, let's talk about home comfort, and you say, how do you leave your house? And she picks up her wallet, her cell phone, her purse, her keys, leaves the house, air conditioning is blasting, TV is on, you learn a lot, right? You learn different things because you're observing what people are doing in situ, what they're actually acting on. And so I think this notion of anthropological research is, is really important to uncover new things. It's good to have an analytical work later on to refine what you're doing, but it's really important to, to go broad initially and, and use ethnography to get there. And go to extreme users. Um, you know, if you talk to people all in the middle of the bell curve, you don't learn a lot. If you talk to people on the, on the margins, people who are living off the grid, people who are hypermilers, people who are, are doing unusual things around their energy usage, um, you learn a lot more because what we've seen time and time again is what's on the extreme eventually moves into the mainstream. Uh, whether we're talking about adoption of technology. Uh, the first cell phone I ever saw was when I was 10 years old in somebody's car. It was really weird. It was huge. It was really freaky. It was total future. And here we are some years later and everybody has one walking around with a personal computer. So there are extreme users. We see those behaviors under the mainstream over time. So go to them instead of the bell curve, the middle of the bell curve. Um, you need to make time and space to really make sense. Um, you need time to kind of dig into it. So having a, a particularly crafted space in which for you to work, take your ideas, develop a synthesis of, of what you've heard from your users, and really start to uh, embed what you want to do um, into a space and actually use that space to, to foster new thinking um, and, and really live and breathe in the work. I think that's really important. But also give your time for synthesis because if you're going straight from research to designing something, you're missing a lot of opportunities along the way. Uh, prototyping. Um, prototyping, often people hear about a prototype like a product prototype. But there are other kinds of prototypes you can do as well. You can do service prototypes. You can test ideas early and often to, to fail faster, to, to, to fail quickly, to succeed sooner. And this was a great prototype because um, this would have been a good place to prototype. This was uh, uh, when Walmart was rolling out their new uh, milk jugs. Um, they actually had to uh, have a little seminars for people on how to pour milk um, because it was really hard. And um, this is a great su you know, supply chain story in terms of how much how many cartons of milk they could stack on a pallet, how, many, how much more milk they could ship for how much less carbon, uh, less plastic in the containers, all of those things. But the human element was missing. If they'd prototyped uh, containers with people, they would, have, they would have seen that. And finally, iterate. When you're prototyping, you want to get through ideas quickly and because and, you're not going to hit the target the first time around. So you actually have to uh, take your ideas and, and, and shape them and shape them quickly. And then finally, craft a story. Um, this is a project I did some, uh, a, a little while back on um, a thermostat. And what we found was that people weren't that interested in a thermostat. Um, surprise, right? Because their only thermostat experience at the time was something with very little information. If it was programmable, it was really hard to use, and nobody actually programmed it. They just used a little up and down button, and that was the extent of it. But we found that you know, having something that was a familiar meme like a clock was important for people that put it in a central place, the social place around a kitchen at an exit point. People would then start to use and interact the, with a the thermostat differently, but also surfacing the information in the right way. So now we're talking about something that's a social hub of a household rather than a thermostat. And it's about home comfort, not saving energy. 
Um, the, more, the longer I've been in the space around uh, sustainability, which is my entire career, I began as an environmental broadcast journalist in, uh, in Asia, um, the more I realized that we can't really talk about sustainability because that's a pretty divisive message right now. We really need to start with the user, focus on their needs, and provide a story for them that can help them adopt the product or service we're talking about. Within this, though, design thinking is one tool. The other tool is systems thinking, and I think that's equally important because uh, fundamentally, if you design something that's just desirable for people, that's just necessary for people, you may miss some unintended consequences of your design in the system, right? You could create something where it actually has a larger impact through the supply chain or at end of life because you haven't anticipated the system feedback loops and consequences. So we really need to bring that into, into play. And now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about consumption. We already see consumption patterns starting to shift. Um, and we start talking about, instead of having products that we own, we're talking about experiences uh, in some cases. This was an experience that I had in, 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 in Denmark where you know, they're selling bottles of whiskey, cognac, et cetera, but they're selling it in tiny little bottles. So you could try a lot of different things. You don't have to buy one big bottle and have it sit there for years as I might do. And, and you can try different things. And so you actually have a really sticky story to tell around how you're using products, how you're using this. And you have a great experience because you go in and you can chat with other people while you're trying them, uh, talk to the owner. You learn a lot. It's a shared experience. Uh, plus, by the way, you're using reusable containers. Your shipment costs are less because you're gross shipping it to the store. I mean, there are all these unintended, uh, or intended rather, consequences of good design, plus you're creating a great experience. So we see these consumption patterns st are starting to shift. We're seeing these new models of consumption and collaborative consumption, whether we're talking about turning a product into a service, new methods of uh, redistribution, and collaborative uh, lifestyles. But here's the problem, is that oftentimes, when we're talking about, you know, and I've heard the conversation time and time again with energy people, like, okay, is it about consumer behavior change or is it about infrastructure? And then they're like, oh, it's, it's you know, everybody sort of comes to the agreement after having an in-depth conversation. Well, it's both. And the truth is it's both, absolutely. But there's a third piece here that's, that's missing in the broader sustainability conversation a lot of times. And people were talking about it just a little while ago about the energy policy in Europe, um, in Germany specifically is that oftentimes if we just focus on behavior change or we just focus on supply chain infrastructure issues or we just focus on policy, it's a sort of whack-a-mole experience of like trying to hit one thing and it pops up somewhere else. And we miss the system's opportunities to have this cascading impact by bringing people along to help redesign the system or forcing the redesign of the system because you've brought people on. And we have an example of that later on. So, Here's some things that I think are important that I think we can do to make this a different kind of uh, conversation and how we can better support this notion of sustainable consumption. One is we have to make data meaningful. Um, data is not really intelligent. Uh, and you, know, you can talk to an engineer about data and, and they have a different appreciation for it. But for the average person, they really want information. They really want to understand things through synthesized data. So you can't just give them numbers, that's insufficient. We start to think about applications of data and applications of this way to make data meaningful. I think it's interesting to talk about as we're going from a device connected world to an interconnected world around data. Um, and you know, by the year 2050, we're going to have uh, 50 billion devices connected to the internet. Right? That's staggering. But what does that mean? It means we're going to be drowning in data unless we synthesize it into information to make it interesting and to make it actionable. One of my favorite devices that's connected to the internet is Beijing Air. Um, has everybody seen this Twitter feed? Oh, it, it, it's a hoot and holler because this is one of those great things where you're, where you're, where you're putting an idea out there that's really disruptive to a local uh, uh, local interests, but people use it and start to trust it differently than their own uh, data. This is an EPA rated uh, air quality rig on the roof of the US Embassy in Beijing. Um, and it just pisses off the local politicians fiercely, right? 
But that's also why it's fantastic because you know they're they've just rejiggered their air quality standards or or interpretations. So people walk outside and the air is literally orange, and they're hearing it's an okay day uh, for air quality. And then they go to the Beijing Air Twitter feed uh, for those who can get through the firewall of China, and uh, and see that it's actually un unhealthy. So this is a way to to take data and turn it into information for people to act on. When I think about Devices. I'm going to talk a little bit about devices here, but I'm also talking about integrated device uh, and service experiences. That it's not all just about the smartphone, although the smartphone, I would argue, is the biggest uh, fundamentally transformative tool in sustainability that we have. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing that's really neat, and if I talk to, you know, when we were, I've done a, been involved in a couple of thermostat uh, design projects along the way, and at each each project, there was a point where they're like, well, people will never pay X dollars for a thermostat. And that's true if the thermostat you're offering me is the, is the ones that existed previously. But Nest is a startup um, that's gotten a lot of press out of, out of the Bay Area. Um, they've done a wonderful job of making it personal, making it learn from you how you use energy and give you tips and tricks on how to use your energy differently in an appropriate way. It also gives you control of your house energy through your smartphone, through an app they have. It's fundamentally different than how we've ex had the opportunity to experience energy information before. Now you're able to make it personal. You're able to compete against yourself. You'll be able to compete against your neighbors. Um, it's also a learning device. So I'm not having to sit there and teach it how to, how to do things. It's learning how I want my house, how my home, and then guides me along uh, helping me improve my energy efficiency. So how might we create integrated device experiences that learn from us? How might we surface information holistically, continuously, discreetly? Uh, this goes to the challenge of too much data, right? Um, this is a project, Planetary Scan Institute, that I find really inspiring because it's taking uh, microsensing, ubiquitous connections to the internet, as well as um, uh, constant, it's a partnership between uh, uh, Cisco and NASA, and so they're using space imaging as well. And so when you take these things and you start to bring them together, imagine the implications for a farmer in India around water usage or what crop to plant. Now they're able to provide crop insurance because they know what the weather patterns are gonna be. From the microsensing, they know what the ground conditions are. They know what the market conditions are. So they can have better information, help the farmers uh, provide the right products to market, as well as give them the supports necessary to be successful in that endeavor. These are the kinds of transformative initiatives that are going to become more commonplace with this triumvirate of, of always-on internet uh, sensing and, and imaging, as well as having devices that allow us to do that. We need to make information personal. In the same way that we've taken data and synthesized it into information, we need to actually make it meaningful to, to us. And uh, a friend of mine got this, uh, Burgerville, anybody been there? It's an Oregon burger chain. Um, this is the beginning where, you know, when we talk about extreme users, I, I think Burgerville was an extreme user because it's about three years old now. And what they did was, uh, I don't know how visible this is here, but what you can see is that my friend got one small chocolate hazelnut shake modest uh, purchase, 319, a little expensive, I guess, 640 calories, and then it had the amount of fiber, the fat, and the carbs in it, percentage of your daily value of if you had a 2,000 calorie diet or a 2,500 calorie diet, and then down here, it gives you advice on what you could order differently that would, and what the impacts would be. Now, I, I, how do people feel about that? Is that a good thing? Uh, I think so. I think it is. Um, what, what I like about this is this is the beginning of, of acting on a trend that we're seeing. Um, any fans of the quantified self here? The quantified self? It's a really interesting, this is a bleeding edge trend among people who are measuring everything about their lives. The amount of exercise they take in, the amount of calories they take in, uh, exactly how much protein they take in, and then measuring the impacts of how it affects their health. 
They're doing it things around their own sexuality. They're doing it around their, their personal finance. Quantifying everything and then broadcasting it. And this is a way to, to, to make data personal, to make it meaningful to people, to start to shift behavior. But the important thing here and the, the, that I like about this example is it's making meaning out of something that's pretty messy, right? I mean, when people, I don't know who here has ever tried to track calories, it can be a pain in the ass before you had a smartphone with a great app on it. Um, this helps you get there, but it also provides some direction, some, some little supports. It doesn't say, don't get this. It just says, there's a consequence, right? Maybe you want to get something else next time, <laughs> you know, mix it up, have a little bit more fiber in your diet, but it's, 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 it's subtle. Now imagine, if you will, we started to do this on our devices and we're able to broadcast this, share this with friends, make it social, get feedback from experts at the same time, and have the support at the moment of purchase before we pay with our cell phone. That's where we're going. Um, and that to me is really heartening because we can apply those same lessons in, in sustainability. Um, and this is really about your, your personal sustainability. Um, this notion of creating integrated device experiences that guide us, we talked about a little bit with the Nest example. This is more specific. I, I, I love this, this company, Opower, for anybody who's not familiar with it, check it out. It's a really great application. One of the things we're looking at at the World Economic Forum uh, Global uh, Agenda Council on Sustainable Consumption is behavior change. And how do you design for behavior change? And this is really important because, you know, it is a whack-a-mole thing out there, but we've got to help people get to the right behaviors and support them in getting to the right behaviors. One of the fundamental challenges we have around behavior change is there's an absence of self-efficacy. Um, and self-efficacy is the notion that you as an individual can have an impact on something that's complex, global, and systemic. Climate change is a perfect example. I have friends who don't believe in climate change, who think we're, you know, there's too many of us on, uh, uh, on the earth doing too small behaviors. We can't possibly affect something as big and complex as our planet. It's really a fundamental conversation, uh, a fundamental idea with them. I have other friends who are like, well, I actually believe in climate change, but I don't know what to do as an individual. Whether or not I drive to the store is irrelevant because I don't see what the impact of that would be for me. Tools like this start to surface ways for us to understand how we not just have impact, but how we can have agency, how we can start to mitigate our impacts by utilizing these kinds of tools. And Opower gives you a nice little thing, a little smiley face, you're, you're doing good, right? That's nice, or you get a frowny face, that's less good. Although they may have uh, eliminated that from the latest UI because people found it to be kind of negative. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really great example of, of helping people along and giving them the, the, the information that's personal, that helps them see that opportunity for, for behavior change. Um, we also have to make action seamless because, you know, anybody who's spent any time in sustainability looks at recycling. Wow, recycling alone is hard. I, you know, I got to put this in that bin. I got to put that in that bin. I got to put my compost here. I don't want to do any of that. I just want to throw it in one thing, right? And actually, I don't even want to do that. I want to have somebody else throw in a thing for me. So, you know, we got to figure out ways to make the action seamless. Um, and I think this is a, a, a really important insight when we think about how to get to sustainable consumption. Um, and this is a, a bit of a red herring here because I, I realized I didn't have, uh, when I was looking over my slides uh, uh, last night, I was like, well, I don't have anything from the supply chain. I should put something in there. So um, I, I think there's something in here which is, this is, is seamless. This doesn't affect you or me or anything in terms of how we live our lives, but this is a great example of redesigning something that was completely undesigned, which was a commercial wooden pallet. And Ikea decided that they didn't need to do that. They started to use polypropylene skids, which allowed them to, to pack more material into cargo ships, allowed them to take heavier loads, um, and was fundamentally far more energy efficient um, and saved resources than the pallet. Great example of a, of a supply chain innovation that, that gets to this notion of making action seamless. Other examples are we've quickly gone from uh, talking about how we can share a fleet of vehicles through a company like Zipcar to how I can share my own car through a company like Relay Rides to how I can make um, a ride available to me at any time with no commitment, no resources whatsoever except paying the driver directly. And this is an example of that. There's Sidecar, there's Uber, there's a number of these disruptive startups 
where it's starting to utilize an untapped, uh, rapidly expiring um, inventory, which is an empty seat in an automobile. And if I'm driving somewhere and I realize that I can make a couple of bucks by having somebody along, one, it could be really interesting. Two, um, you know, they're right there, and so you can identify where you are on, on, on sidecar, and someone will say, oh, I need a ride from there to there. Why don't you come pick me up? It's all seamless, it's easy. I pick the person up, they pay me a little money, it's a donation because you don't want to piss off the taxi commission. Um, but it's a really, it's an interesting technology, and we're going to see more and more of this kind of technologies that are going to be emergent, that are going to disrupt the existing systems. Um, but what's important about this, I think, is when we talk about this notion of going to, from you know, uh, collaborative consumption to the notion of consumption without consuming, this is sort of where we're, where we're getting to. And what's going to be interesting is where we start to see pushback from existing entrenched systemic interests, whether it's a tax commission, whether it's uh, the, your local busing company, whether it's uh, auto manufacturers, we're going to see a lot of that, but what I believe is what we're going to see is a trend toward adoption of these kinds of tools that really help us uh, create experiences that meet us where we are and meet our, our, our real unmet needs. Um, I, I think this notion of collaborative consumption is great. I think it needs a bit of a rebranding, and Patagonia just did this last year. Um, everybody familiar with this? Everybody seen this? No? Uh, super cool. Patagonia basically said, don't buy our stuff. Okay, that's crazy, but you know, they're, they're kind of like that. They're pretty, pretty committed to this. Um, but they did say, trade our stuff. And I love this example because it highlights some of the fundamental design principles of Patagonia. One, great gear. Two, super durable gear. Three, uh, you know, there's a story behind it, right, and how you used it. And through this, this collaboration they had with eBay, this Common Threads initiative, now it involved people trading not just their Patagonia clothing, but their stories about their clothing. You know, I wore this gear on this thing, on this experience, and then that becomes part of the story and allows this new, this, this sort of very tangible, sticky brand messages around, around our products that now you're, you're sharing and become part of the currency of brand. That to me is really exciting. Um, we're gonna be seeing more of this rebranding. We're not gonna call it collaborative consumption. We're not even gonna call attention to it. It's just gonna be about great, well-designed gear that's super high performance, that has a great story behind it. And this really enables that. Finally, and here's the hard part. We need to make the systems sustainable. Um, I talked about Patagonia a moment ago. Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia, has said, and they're farther along than any apparel company, has said, we're not sustainable, right? And we know we're not. We know we're, we're you know, as we become, as we become more uh, addicted is the wrong word, if we become more entrenched in this notion of incremental improvements, whether it's energy or water efficiency over time, we still have a fundamental challenge in that we're still overextended in our water usage. We're still overextended in our natural resource consumption. So we actually need to make the system more sustainable. Um, and I, I admit, in talking about devices, that there's a challenge here, right? Um, this is a picture of 428,000 cell phones. Um, one of my favorite artists who takes these ideas of individual impact, aggregates them, turns them into art, Chris Jordan, a guy out of Seattle, creates these images where it really calls attention to the challenges that we have as a society. That 400,000 some odd cell phones is the amount of uh, cell phones that are discarded by Americans on a daily basis. Anybody else freaked out? I am. The challenge is a lot of these cell phones don't ever end up in, you know, they never get to landfill, they never get to uh, uh, recycling because they end up in your sock drawer, right? And you're like, oh, that, I remember that cell phone. That was, remember that brick, that Sony brick from 1999? Uh, that's crazy. And you leave it there. There is a company that's starting to address that. Uh, one of my last projects at, at uh, BSR, Business for Social Responsibility, before I left was around conflict minerals. Here's a company that wants to take conflict minerals out of the cell phone, that wants to put social values first, that wants to uh, make a phone that's fully sustainable. 
um, and they're calling it Fairphone. And I think that is seriously cool, as they call it, yes. And what makes it particularly cool for me is there's a legacy of green products out there that are kind of lousy experiences. You know, and it's like, oh, I gotta, this is, these are the trade-offs I have to make to buy green. I have to have something that doesn't have apps on it. I have to, you know, I have to buy something that, you know, may look a little different. Here's a phone where it's great design. It's Android. It's a fantastic uh, interface. It's going to have the exact same experience. The difference is it's going to be able to be much more closed loop. You're going to have, a, it has a social mission to it. Um, that, to me, is a redesign of the system and fundamentally changes how we utilize uh, and dispose of devices. Uh, my final example, seriously, how might we redesign the system? So I talk about one company. Let's talk about the entire system. Uh, this is B-Labs. Everybody familiar with B-Labs? Uh, B-Labs is a great example of taking, you know, one of the challenges we have in business today is Companies, if they're publicly traded, are mandated by the SEC to maximize uh, return to investors. And this is particularly true at a, a, a liquidity event, at a sale. The founders of B-Labs started an apparel company, embedded in it a social mission, grew the company to something like $600 million, and then they sold it. And when they sold it, the company said, thank you very much, and just took the social mission right out of the business. And I can't imagine what that feels like as an as a entrepreneur to build a business. And I'm sure you know, they're really proud of their financial success, but they're even more proud of the social legacy. In fact, they were because they then created B-Lab. The intent of B-Lab is to certify corporations for sustainability, not products. So as you get certified as a B Corp, you're certified against a transparent set of criteria in terms of your impacts, how you give back to your communities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They're also, in states around the United States, uh, embedding uh, laws that allow company to have, to be protected from investors, uh, lawsuits, litigation essentially, saying that it's okay to, to, and it's encouraged and necessary to have a return to not just shareholders, but broader stakeholders. That is people, social returns, environmental returns. And to write that into the governance of companies. And they've passed this law now in 12 states and they expect within three years it's gonna be all 50 states. What's great about this, totally bipartisan issue. People are just like, oh yeah, that's great. Let's, let's help business solve the problem. So it's a great model. Um, the next thing that B Corp is doing is, um, is creating an investment community that helps put money into B Corps. Um, Patagonia is a B Corp, Numi T, uh, uh, Ben and Jerry's, uh, Cabot Creamery, there are a bunch of different businesses that are B Corps uh, and really, really exciting. The thing that I think is also really interesting here is one of the trends I've seen for years now is that as sustainability has become slowly calcified in the role of CSR for the most part, where it's become really about this risk reduction and incrementalism, the same thing has happened in a different silo around innovation. And large companies have had more and more difficulty innovating because it's hard to do what's next when you have a new, when you have an existing business that's fantastic. So they've done more innovation by acquisition. And one of the things that I think is really interesting here is you're seeing a lot of innovators that are becoming B Corps. They're led by, uh, by people whose values are in, in, in using business to positively impact the world, positively change things. And when they sell their business, embedded in their business is going to be this notion around a social return, an environmental return to broader set of shareholders, a broader set of stakeholders. So the company then, these large multinationals, are going to acquire the B Corps, and it's going to shine a light on what their returns are to the broader set of stakeholders. And it's going to call a, 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 a broader set of questions around their system. And we're starting to see these things bubble up in different places. So fundamentally, um, where, where I'd like to leave it is, you know, if we take some of these precepts of making data personal and making, making data meaningful and making information personal, making action seamless and making systems sustainable, that we can get there. We can get towards sustainable consumption. Um, and for me, in my career, it's very easy to, uh, to get down, uh, to get cynical about things. There are a lot of challenges that we face. But fundamentally, I believe that we don't have a choice. Focus on the bright spots um, and help enlarge those bright spots into, into creating systemic change. Uh, thank you.